Hi, I'm Miranda Wright, and this is day 30 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. And today, we're going to pray for the unction. The unction of the Holy Ghost is not a very modern word. It's not something that we use a lot in our Christian lingo anymore. But it is very important, and it is something we ought to pray for, for ourselves and for the greater body in general. By definition, the word unction, as it is used in the New Testament, literally translates to the anointing. But it is used a bit more specifically to a special type of anointing. And the best way I can explain it is like a Holy Ghost push. We all are required to seek the Lord, to get on our face and press in and press through and wait upon the Lord until we have heard. But there are those times... But there are those times when the power of the anointing falls upon you. The spirit of the living God comes with such clarity and power that you absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt what the Holy Spirit is telling you. And you have to respond. This is the unction. You see, my friend, real faith demands a response. And of course, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why it's so important for me to mix revelation in with our prayer podcasts, because the anointing will come when the revelation comes. And with revelation, there is motivation and an expectation to act because faith demands a response. In the last few prayer podcasts, we've talked about different responses. We talked about the response of worship, the way Saul's son responded to the presence of the king when he came before David and he fell on his face and acknowledged him and worshiped. Our response to the revelation and presence of Jesus Christ should be worship. We talked about correction and how important it is that once the revelation of an error, mistake, or sin had been brought forth by the Holy Spirit that we immediately respond with the right response. And of course, the response is repentance. And today we're continuing in that vein concerning those moments when the Lord has put something before us in all clarity and understanding, when the Lord has spoken the response must be action and quick action to the words of the Holy Spirit is unction faith in action now of course this can manifest in many different ways because we know that God takes us through many seasons in our life we can be represented as a seed and he takes us through a season of burying and in that season of burying we have to wait upon the Lord And we have to go through a season of dying. There is a stripping that every child of God must go through to take away our faith in what we used to be and the way we used to do it so that we can let go and just die before we can truly be resurrected in newness of life. There is a hiding season where God told many of the prophets of old, go hide thyself, learn how to hear from thee, get in that cave season where you truly get to learn my voice and learn to be fed by me and learn to be led by me. There is a dying and there is a reviving. There is a growing where he begins to grow us in grace and branch out our faith. There is a growing and then finally there is a going. And it is important to be obedient to the unction of the Holy Spirit in every season to know exactly what you ought do and do it. When God first calls you, he will bid you come and die. But when he anoints you, he will bid you go and revive. When Jesus first called the disciples, they spent a season with him learning and being led and being taught by him. Where he was stripping away the teachings of the world and the things they thought they knew. And growing them in wisdom and in knowledge in his word. And this was him bidding them, come, pick up your cross, follow after me. But there came a point at which he was ready to give them a great commission. And he told them, wait to be endowed with power, but once that has happened, go and tell. He bid them go and revive. Tell others. Give them the good news. Tell them everything that I have told you. Teach them everything that I have taught you. Leave nothing out. Do it my way, and I will be with you. 
You see, the problem is, is that oftentimes when we want to go, God is telling us, go hide thyself. And when we want to stay and hide thyself, God is telling us, go. So we need the unction of the Holy Spirit. We need to get to that place where we know beyond a shadow of a doubt what the Lord is saying. We need to have the discipline to seek the Lord and find out what it is that he's saying and how he's saying it. We need to be cautious never to act on impulse, but to act on unction. And never to mistake impulse for unction. Because they are not the same. A person who is led of the Spirit is never led of their emotions or their impulses. Because the emotions are part of the soul, not the spirit. The mind, the will, and the emotion. Which is something that is easily influenced by spirits. But the Holy Spirit will deliver the unction a knowing with clear detail and why. He will bring you revelation. He will prepare you with bears and lions before he ever causes you to face Goliath so that when he tells you go, you know what you're going to do. God is greatly impressed by a faith that is willing to obey immediately and not to put things off. You see, I've got to tell you a little bit about Elijah because God does work in seasons and we need to understand the reasons for the seasons and why the spirit is leading us into these seasons. You see the prophet Elijah, you see the prophet Elijah early on in his story, he stood before King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Now Queen Jezebel was causing all of the priests and prophets of the Lord to be put to death and replacing them with prophets of Baal. This was a very bold thing that Elijah had to do. He was obedient to the unction of the Holy Spirit. He knew that God was calling him to stand before this wicked king and queen and deliver the word of the Lord. And he did and he spoke forth the truth and he shut up the reins and the heavens obeyed him and he spoke forth the truth even though he thought he was the only one left in the entire kingdom that was willing to speak the truth of the word of God. He thought he had it all figured out. He thought he knew exactly what God was going to do with him. He stood before them and he did what he was told. And then immediately after this mighty move where he stood in the courts of kings, someone in Elijah's position might think, oh, well, God really favors me. God's really using me. I'm really submitted to the Lord. Look, I was the only one willing to deliver this mighty word of the Lord that was backed up by the power of heaven with signs, wonders, and miracles to prove. Surely the Lord is going to bless me and give me a mighty ministry and cause men to come underneath me that I might teach them how to be as great as I am. But that's not what happened. After standing in the courts of kings and being the greatest prophet in the kingdom, the only one willing to speak this truth, God tells him, go hide thyself. Go to the brook Kareth in the middle of the wilderness, sit in a cave and wait. Elijah couldn't listen to his flesh. He, he couldn't listen to his soul. He couldn't listen to his emotions. He couldn't listen to his logic. He couldn't listen to what he wanted to do. He couldn't run out and take the kingdom. He couldn't just act on a whim. He couldn't be impulsive. He had to surrender to the unction of the Holy Spirit that said, go sit and wait. So therefore he went and he went to the cave. He went to the brook Cherith because it's important the wording that God gave here. He told him, go hide thyself by the brook Cherith, which is before the Jordan. Because you see, this was a place where he would have to get alone with God. This is a place where he would have to hear clearly from God. This is a place where he would have to be still. Because often we get so busy and we move under impulse and under our own direction that we cannot hear clearly from the Lord. Therefore, he will send us back to the cave and say, wait. Because it was in this place that Elijah was fed by birds day and night by the very hand of God. God had to teach him some things. You see, because it was in the place of the palace where God first used him that God planted a seed of faith in him. But that seed was not anywhere ready to do the greater work that God had planned for him. So God had to send him out to the wilderness. And as he sat in this wilderness and learned how to be fed personally by God as the ravens brought him his meat every day. He learned how to depend completely on God, that, that he would never be tempted to have to fall into the dependency of others or the temptations of the lands or their tools 
or their idols. He knew he could draw completely on the Lord because of the lessons learned at the brook Kareth. Because let me tell you, the word Kareth means cutting away. It was the place of cutting away. God put a seed of faith in him and what he caused him to do. Because you see, God put that seed of faith in him in the courtroom in the palace, showing him what God would have him do later, but then pulled him back so that he could cut some things away. He could kill some things that needed to die. He could cultivate some things that needed to cultivate. He could teach him. The Kareth was the place of cutting in the wilderness, in that cave where he learned how to hear clearly from the Lord and to understand why God tells him to do the things that he tells him to do, how to be fed by God himself, that he would never be tempted to become dependent upon the tools and tactics of the lands that he was about to be sent into to give him the faith that he never had to compromise so that he could get the resources of the enemy to achieve the king's mandate because that he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt God was able to supply all his need because he had spent his time at the brook being fed by God's own hand, getting that revelation personally, getting that word from the Lord. You see, many people are led astray because they went and sought for a word from somebody else and it came from another spirit, but they didn't spend time on their face before God to learn how to truly be fed by him, that they not be deceived by the other spirits because God says that many spirits are going out into the world. Therefore, you need to test the spirits to see whether or not they are of God. And my friend, I'm telling you that if you are not spending the time on your face at the brook in that cave season to get that word directly from the Lord himself, then the enemy will send a many a word your way and it will confuse and confound and get you working for other spirits, powers, and principalities against the very will of God and think that you're working for him. Remember that Jesus warned even his own disciples that the time will come when men will seek to kill those who follow me and think that they're doing God's will. How great is the deception? How cunning is the deceiver? You better learn how to be fed by God himself. You better get in that cave and learn how to hear. You better spend your time at the Cherith before the Jordan. Because you see the Jordan, that was the river that you crossed over to go into the promised land. That's the place of crossing over. That's the place where you step into the thing that you were really called to walk in. But you have to spend your time at the Cherith before the Jordan. You have to spend your time getting stuff cut off of you before the Jordan. You have to spend your time learning how to hear from the Lord before the Jordan. You got to spend your time learning how to be fed by his own hand so that you're not deceived once you cross over the Jordan. Because once you cross over the Jordan, there's a lot of Canaanites. And let me tell you, yes, it is the land of milk and honey, but you're going to have to face a lot of bulls and bees before you get to that milk and honey. Don't run ahead. Don't cross the brook. Because you see, the seed of faith that was planted in the palace had to take root, it had to grow, and it had to branch out. And it's during that time in the wilderness, in that cave by the brook, where God is cutting things away, that he's growing your faith, that he's branching out your faith into new areas, that you're becoming dependent on him, that you're getting that word so that you know that you know that it's time to go. Therefore, when the unction comes, you can obey with all assurity and no confusion, knowing that the mission will be accomplished because I have been equipped. So we need to understand the unction, pray for it, and know when it's telling us to stay, to wait, to hear, to grow, or to go. Because impulse will weary you and endanger you, but unction will empower you. I'm teaching you something today, people, because we're going to ask God for it. But we have to understand what we're asking for so that we can believe by faith to receive it. Because with the anointing comes revelation and with revelation comes motivation. And with motivation, God has an expectation that you will act. The response matters. You see, God has all mercy and compassion. When we don't know things, he is willing to teach us and lead us and bring us to that place of understanding. But once we know, once we have the unction of the Holy Spirit, he has made his will clear. He has made his word clear. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt what it is he is saying. He expects us to act upon that. He expects a response. You see, it was Saul's lack of response to what the Holy Spirit had spoken that cost him the kingdom. It was David's swiftness to respond to the words that the Holy Spirit had spoken that preserved his. 
You see, God had a great work for Elijah to do once he crossed over the Jordan. But he was not ready to do it with all faith, power, and a surety to come out of that wilderness in the power of the Spirit, just like Jesus and every other man and woman of God in Scripture who had to spend their time in the wilderness first, getting that word from the Lord, that clear, concise direction, spending that time in the cave to be filled up with something before you go and pour out. Because if you have not been filled up by God first, then you have nothing to pour out but flesh, and flesh will bring only death. So my friend, get on your face before the Lord, get a word from the Lord, and then walk in that unction with all assurity and faith and steadfastness because you know that you have heard. God demands a quick response to his word, and that is the unction. We see this demonstrated in the woman at the well. When the revelation that she was talking to the Christ, the Messiah that they had been waiting for, fell upon her, the anointing hit her, the unction hit her. It says, and immediately she dropped her water pot and straightway went to the town to preach Christ unto the men. The revelation was dropped. She saw it. She understood it. She believed it. Therefore, the anointing came and she responded to it immediately. The response matters. When the word of the Lord came unto Abraham and promised him the promised land, he said, go out and walk and wherever the soles of your feet shall tread, I shall give it unto you. And Abraham believed enough to take action. He did it. He obeyed. He didn't just say, well, I believe what you're saying, Lord, so I'm going to wait this thing out or I'm going to figure out another way to do it. I'm going to do it a different way. He obeyed. He went. And because of that, God counted him faithful. He was moved by the unction. Every one of the disciples had to face this when Jesus came up to them and put out his hand and said, are you willing to abandon everything right now? Pick up your cross and follow me. In the book of Luke, we read the story of Jesus coming up to the boats. He had been preaching on the shoreline. And Peter and the two sons of Zebedee who worked for Peter were on their fishing boats. And they had been fishing all night, but they had not caught anything. And so Jesus comes to them and he gets on their boat. And he preaches and brings the word from the boat. And then he tells them, cast out into the deep. And he tells them to cast their nets out into the deep, into the water on the other side. And Peter says, we've been doing this all night and we have not caught anything. But nevertheless, because you have spoken it, we will. And they caught a multitude grander than anything they had ever caught before. He responded to the word. Because you see, my friend, he had been laboring all night in his own strength. Jesus was not in it. He was doing what he knew to do. He was going through the motions. Peter was a very good fisherman. Peter come from a family of fishermen. They all knew how to go through the motions. Peter had a big fishing business. He had employees under him. The two sons of Zebedee were actually his employees. He owned these boats. It was a business. It was a big operation. And he knew how to go through the motions. And here comes this man. Who does he think he is? Does he not think that I know how to fish? We've done this all night. But let me tell you, friends, they went through the motions all night and they didn't catch a thing because Jesus wasn't in it. But when the time came, the word was released and Jesus stepped into that boat and he said, do this, though it made no sense. They cast out into the deep. They threw it on the other side. They did it another way because the word had been given, because Jesus spoke it, because he believed enough to act upon the unction of the word of God once it had been released. Not just going through the motions before because it was the thing to do and it was the thing his family did and it was the thing the business did. It was the thing the church usually does. It's the thing our grandfathers did before. But when the word of the Lord came forth, when the rhema spoke, And he knew that now Jesus is in the boat 
were going to trust them. He cast out and they caught a great multitude. They did the same things they did before. They went through the same motions that they had gone through before, but now it was totally different. And let me tell you, my friend, when the unction of the Holy Spirit is there, you can do the same things you did before and you will have results. But when it's not there, you can do the same things that you did when it was and you will have no result. I'll give you an example of this. We often say that's an anointed song, but God does not anoint worship songs. He anoints worshipers. If that were not the case, then every time we would hear that song, there would be an anointing and a moving and a flowing and an outpouring. And it would happen every time because the anointing would be on the song. The anointing is not on the song. The anointing is on the life of the person that is delivering the song. Catherine Kuhlman would often say that if the Holy Spirit were to depart from me, I would be the most ordinary person on the face of the earth and I could go through the same motions and I could do the same things and I could say the same things and nothing would happen. Just like those fishermen in that boat because they worked all night and they went through the motions and they labored and they wearied and they got nothing for it. But once the Lord was in the boat, once he had spoken, once he had given the word, they moved upon the unction of that word and there was fruit. And let me tell you something, they weren't tired at all. They weren't labored at all. They were excited. They were enthused. They were rejuvenated and regenerated because the unction was there. My friends, we need unction. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Therefore, if there has not been a clear word from the Lord, then we are not moving in faith. We are not moving in unction. We are moving in impulse. And then there's the other end of the spectrum. The one who does hear, but doesn't respond. And we see this exemplified in the rich young ruler who I have sometimes referred to as the almost disciple. Because if you look at the wording that Jesus used when he spoke to the rich young ruler, it was the same wording that he used when he called out all of his other disciples. Only that his response was not the same as those who were chosen. You see, when the rich young ruler comes, Jesus begins to search his heart. And he identifies the thing in his heart that he trusts, that he loves, that he depends upon, that he leans upon, his wealth, his possessions. And so Jesus calls that thing out and identifies it. Are you willing to sell all of your possessions, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me? Of course he would not. And in doing so, Jesus identifies that there is another God on the throne of your heart. There is another lover. There is something else upon whom you depend. There is something else that you trust more than me. Because I'm telling you that if you will give up everything and walk away with nothing, then I can give you more. I can bring the real, but you first have to be willing to let go of the false. Jesus points it out. But he won't respond. He won't move by the unction. And so Jesus doesn't give him another chance. He doesn't sugarcoat. He doesn't say, I'll give you some time. He lets him walk away. And Jesus chooses somebody else. Someone who will respond to the words that he has to say. Because when the word of God speaks... We have to receive it by faith, and faith demands a response, or it is not faith at all. God is merciful. God is patient. God knows our frame and remembers that we are but dust, and he will take us through trial and tribulation and situation and stripping and instructing to show us the way to make us come to that place of understanding where we can clearly hear what it is he is trying to say. But once that we have heard it, he demands a quick response. There's only two things that I can think of that God expects us to do slowly. Everything else, he wants it quickly. He wants us to be quick to listen, quick to hear, quick to humble, quick to repent, quick to obey, quick to serve, quick to forgive. But he does want us to be slow to speak and slow to anger. He doesn't want us getting offended. He doesn't want us acting or speaking on impulse. 
He wants us to wait until we've heard. And once we've heard, to be quick to respond to that word. He wants unction. Every Kairos moment in my life was stepped into by unction. There have been times in my life where God has said, stay, wait, go hide thyself, learn, be stripped. I prayed it out. He's given me the wait. He's given me the no. And there is purpose in those seasons. And honestly, they will be the vast majority of what the Lord calls you to. Because he's got to prepare you for what he's about to walk you through. However, when the Kairos moment came, that moment in time when the word of the Lord comes and says, that says the window is open, the culmination of everything that I have set into play is now. I have prepared you, positioned you, and called you for such a time as this. Go. In those moments, those destiny shifting moments, it demands a response and the unction will bid you go every time in my life when I came to that moment when I was obedient to the Lord to just go God had given me a very specific and very impossible word that he was going to use me to do a thing that in the flesh and in the physical I had absolutely no means of doing no connections to do it and didn't just seem unlikely but was absolutely impossible because because everything was stacked against me being able to do what the Lord was saying he was going to cause me to do. But in faith, I went where he told me to go. And when I got there, he opened up all the doors that were necessary to do what could not be done because of the unction. The Bible says that he knows our frame and remembers that we are but dust. He knows how to bring us into understanding. If we will put away the distractions and the pleasures of this world that are meant to keep dying men from knowing that they are dying, and seek the Lord and stay in his presence where you hear from him daily. He will let you know in so many ways that this is your time. And it will need to come from no other source. But it will come directly from the word of God. He will give you the where. And when you move by the unction of the spirit to get there. He will show you the how. And believe me my friends it will always wow. Because until the plan is so impossible that it cannot be done by your hand. It's not God's plan it's yours. But when he speaks that word that cannot be done, but by faith and obedience, you walk that thing out under the unction of the Holy Spirit and you see the impossible come together, then you know this was God's work. And you know what? It's never even been laboring. It's never been exhausting. It's never been a toil. It has been heart-wrenching. It has been painful. But the Bible says that he who labors to build the house labors in vain except the Lord build the house. And I found in my life that when I was trying to do things in my own strength, it was very exhausting because my physical frame cannot do what need be done. But when the Lord had sent me, just like Peter in that boat, how they had labored and toiled all night. But when the Lord had stepped into my boat and bid me go and told me, put the net down right here, cast out over there. When he gave me the instruction, the commission and put me in the position, it was easy. The harvest came to me. Now, my friend, I'm not telling you that it won't be a fight because it will be a fight. It'll be a Gethsemane. There will be things you will have to endure that are not what your flesh want to endure. People will despise and reject you. People will not believe you. The enemy will rise against you. But if the Lord has called you to it, he will get you through it and you won't have to make anything happen. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was so hard for even Christ himself, he didn't have to make the crucifixion happen. He only had to submit and surrender to it. God will do what you cannot do when you surrender when you stop toiling and laboring to do it when and where and how and with who you think you need to do it and pray for Jesus to get in the boat and when he gets in the boat he'll tell you exactly what to do and when that unction comes respond even if it makes no sense cast the net out on the other side and watch him bring in a harvest God, we pray for the unction of the Holy Spirit. 
We pray for that knowing beyond knowing. God, we pray that you speak to us so clearly that we hear you without a shadow of a doubt and we commit to submit and that we won't quit, but we will move forward in obedience to that. Under the unction of the Holy Spirit, we will drop our pot and straightway go to do that which you have called us to do once it is that you have stepped into the situation and spoken. But God, we're not going to just keep going through the motions. We're not going to act on impulse. We're going to wait for the unction. And we thank you for it because we're asking for it. So we know you're going to deliver it. God, we humble ourselves before you and we pray that you let us know what it is you want to say. Or are you telling us to wait? Or are you telling us to listen? Or are you telling us to learn? Or are you telling us to get into position? Or are you telling us to be buried? Or are you telling us to go hide? Or are you telling us to grow? Or are you telling us to go? God, we need to know. We humble ourselves to your word and we commit to move under the unction once we have heard. But God, open our ears. I pray that you open our ears, Lord. I pray that you open the ears of the church in general, of all of your believers, that they be led of your spirit and not of emotions, Lord. Not of their own logic, not of impulse, not of something they saw somebody else do, not of something they witnessed on the internet and got a good report about because who knows who gave that report. It might not have even come from your mouth. God, we trust you. We're not going to direct our lives and the lives of those around us on things that we heard somebody else say, but we're going to get in the cave. We're going to get in that prayer closet. We're going to clear our plate. We're going to seek your face. We're going to get a word from heaven, and then we're going to move in the unction of the Holy Spirit on it because God, the response matters. We give you praise for your patience, Lord. You're correcting and you're directing. We give you all the glory and honor that you deserve and we humble ourselves before you and seek your face that what need be done can only be done by you. We don't want to go through another night toiling and wearying ourselves in vain, fishing in those old dark waters, moving in the shallows. God, we're going to wait until you step in and you say go and you say put the net right here and you say now fish come. God, we trust in you because when you step into the boat, everything changes. But you didn't step in until they were there cleaning up their nets because they had failed the night before. Sometimes it takes a failure, God. Sometimes it takes a humbling. Sometimes it takes us seeing that it's not going to work our way and that going through the motions just wears you out before we will humble ourselves and seek your face to get that word to know where it is you want to drop that net, where it is you want us to cast out, where it is we got to go to take it into the deep because we want to go deeper. We don't want to stay in the shallows where we were yesterday, where we saw somebody else fishing so we thought it would be a good spot. We want to be led by the leading of your spirit to go to that place that no one else has gone, but that you know we need to be. God, we trust you and we worship you and we humble ourselves before you. God, I pray this upon the entirety of the church that it would be a revelation that you would birth in their heart and in their spirit, that they would carry it with them for the rest of their lives, that they would know that all the works of Egypt are a lie and that somebody else might make it look real good, but it never works out in the end and that all it's going to do is weary men. But God, we trust you to do the greater things. We give you praise that you are faithful, that you are good. We thank you, God, that sometimes I think you sit back and wait until we've tried just so that we can lose faith in our own ability so that we can truly have it in you when you step into the room. God, we thank you for the stripping. We thank you for the time at the Brook Cherith before the Jordan. God, we thank you for the time in the cave where we learned how to hear you. We thank you for the time that we see that you are able to deliver that word, that manna, that fresh revelation from heaven every day that you will bring it to us, that you are able to feed us. Therefore, we do not have to depend on the works of men or on the idols of the land, that we don't have to yoke up with that which is unholy, but we can trust you to do what no man can do. God, that we can give up all of our thoughts, our plans, our desires, our worldly provision. God, that we can be like Peter who was willing to give up a lucrative business 
business that was willing to give up the lifestyle that he knew to give up employees, to give up a livelihood, to throw it all away and say, I need none of this provision because you are my provision. I will pick up my cross and follow you, God. I pray that none of us ever fall into the category of the rich young ruler who had trust in the things of this world and he wasn't willing to let go of that trust. So he couldn't be your disciple. He couldn't go where you wanted him to go. He couldn't do what you wanted him to do. And the saddest thing of all is that he is remembered by history as a man without so much as a name because your word says that if we do not have faith in you, then our name will be removed from the Lamb's book of life. And in the very word of the living God, we see him only as the rich young ruler, a man without so much as a name in your kingdom. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. Teach us how to trust you. Oh God, we are willing to spend that time at the chair that that stuff be stripped away before the day that you step into our boat because we don't want to be found clinging to those things. We want to be willing to do what Peter did to lay it all aside and say, God, I know you can do it. I'm putting away all of my plots and my plans and my provisions and I'm trusting in you to do what only you can do. We've tried it before and it did didn't work, but now you're in the boat and I'm going to cast out into the deep and see the multitudes brought in because I've gotten a word from the word and I believed what I heard and I responded to it in unction, but it'll never happen if you're so busy and distracted moving in impulse. God, show us what's impulse and what's unction. Show us what is influence from the external And what is the unction of the internal? Show us, Lord. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Open our heart. Teach us, O Lord. God, we thank you that you are the teacher and that you send your word to instruct. Because you love. Because you want more. God, we thank you for the mercy that you've had in the times that we have spent all night laboring to bring in that harvest without you in the boat, that in your mercy, you allow us to see how fruitless it is that we might first get on our face and call out to you and wait until you step in and give the word. And then by the unction of the Holy Spirit, go, Lord, give us the unction.